So carburetor maintenance is pretty simple on the 206. All, the biggest thing about it is there's not maintenance as far as if some of you have seen different carburetors with pumpers and a lot of moving parts in it. The 206 carburetor does not have a lot of moving parts. Um, the only part that technically moves internally on the carb is the float. So the float is what regulates how much fuel is in the carburetor. And it also controls the needle, which lets the fuel in and out of the circuits of the carburetor. So your carburetor float are these two parts right here. When we open this up, you'll get a little bit better look of how it goes and what it does. All right, so as if your carburetor is on the cart, it's always important to take it completely off to do your maintenance properly. So you're gonna take off, if you have a slide lock, you're gonna take your lock cap off. You're gonna thread this out and you're gonna pull your slide out of the carburetor. I'm gonna keep the cable on it for now because we're going to uh, touch base a little bit on the slide gauges that you can use uh, to inspect how much your throttle slide is opening. All right, so we take the slide out. Now the next thing we have is fuel lines are off. Uh, vent line is out of your uh, dump tank or out of your um, overflow tank. And we're gonna remove the two nuts that hold the carburetor onto the intake manifold. So they're, the stock nuts and bolts that come on there are non nylocking they're just flange nuts, so you can pretty much just hold one side and loosen the other. Um, when you tighten it back up, it's important not to over tighten them, okay? You can damage the flange of the carburetor. There is an O-ring gasket between the carb and the manifold, so you do get a good seal on there, even without having, you know, 20 foot-pounds of torque on those bolts and nuts. All right, so when we get that, the nuts off and the bolts out, I'm gonna lay those on our table here. Yeah, you guys can slide back over. There you go. We're gonna have our carburetor off. Typically, I'll set it upside down um, to drain it, uh, even just putting it on its back. You, there is gonna be fuel in there. Um, one thing you can do before you take it off, if, it's, if it does have fuel in it, is you can open up this uh, screw here. That's gonna drain the float bowl for you. So when you open that up, wherever this hose is leading to, that's where it's gonna go. All right, so once we got the carburetor off, there's two parts to the body, the exterior basically. So you got your carburetor and you got your float bowl. We've already drained the float bowl out. So we're gonna turn the carburetor upside down to get to the inside. And we're gonna remove the two screws for the float bowl. If you haven't drained your carb and there's still fuel in it, this is where it's all gonna come dumping out, just so you know. All right, I always like doing this on a flat surface, ideally, you can set up a paper towel um, or a, a clean rag or that to do all this disassembly and reassembly on. The cleaner you make your environment, the better off things go. You have less issues. So we're gonna remove your carburetor bowl, okay? And then there's also a bowl gasket or an O-ring. That's gonna come off with it as well. I try to keep those together. When you remove it, you do wanna inspect it carefully. This one's new, so everything looks nice. It's really smooth. Sometimes there'll be a little flange from the molding or that, nothing to be alarmed about. What you want to inspect it for is any cuts, breaks, or any flat spots. Um, there's many times, there's a groove on the bowl here, there's many times I've taken about part carburetors for service and the O-ring is misaligned with the groove. And what'll happen then is it gets flattened out, you can develop a leak. I've seen some that you were surprised they held flu flu uh, fuel, but they did. Um, and then other times I've seen just the slightest uh, defect in that O-ring cause a leak on the carburetor as well. So it's always something to be good to inspect it. This is an item that's not bad to have one or two in your toolbox, okay? All right, so once we've taken the uh, float bowl off, we've inspected that O-ring. Now you can see, we were showing you the float earlier. Now you can see the carburetor float. So this float is what regulates how much fuel comes into the carburetor. It also controls the inlet needle, okay? If you look really close, the inlet needle is under the tab on the float, and that needle is going to move up and down. When the needle is all the way up, it closes the fuel flow. When the needle is dropped down to a certain point, it allows fuel to flow in. That, when it opens and closes, is regulated by what's called your float height. Okay? So there's two, two ways to measure it. they are different, different measurements. One is called your drop, and that's how far this hangs down. This is a little less critical. Um, the reason why we check this, though, is sometimes you'll get a float and when you install it, the float hangs straight down and the needle falls out, all right? So if the needle, when that happens, if you, if you run the fuel down too low, you run the risk of the engine just shutting off, sputtering, stopping. Typically, if it comes down, out that far, the needle comes out of the seat and then you have, it, it's just gonna flood out. So, so that can be checked. Uh, we use a float height gauge that checks both the float drop as well as your actual float height. 
Um, it's a handy little tool. You can find them at a lot of different cart shops. Uh, it's got a slide adjuster on it. So one side is for your drop, which is pretty much a fixed number. Um, that's the one I use with the hole in it. It just helps me determine which side is which. And then the other side is your actual float height. So this little screw here, you can loosen it and raise and lower it. Um, depending on your engine builder or even the weather, that float height's gonna vary a little bit. We use a float height of 860 thousandths. Um, it seems to be good in a lot of different applications. Elevation is gonna sometimes affect your float height. Uh, ambient temperatures, um, ele uh, elevation of where the track you're at. So there's a lot of variables that can affect that. Um, and what, like I said, what it does is it changes your mixture. So if you're either getting more fuel or less fuel for a longer period of time, all right? So if you can imagine our drop, again, we don't want that falling all the way out. We use this gauge as a guideline. That's fairly close, okay? So we're gonna leave that for now. Again, it's not as critical. You just wanna make sure that that needle's falling all the way out. Because as long as there's fuel in there, that's gonna, the float is gonna be floating or suspended, okay? The float height that's critical is when you hold the carb, if you wanna say upside down, okay? What this does is this is how high that float gets before it shuts the carburetor off, okay? So if we turn it back over, how much fuel in that bowl causes that needle to close? Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when that hits that, when it hits the float height that you have it set at, then it shuts the needle off. So if you have the whole float height set further down, you're going to be allowing more fuel in. If you have it set further up when you're holding it upside down, it's gonna shut off sooner. The sooner, it, the sooner it closes that needle, the leaner you're making your setting. So if you're at a track where you have uh, a lot of altitude change or like hills in, in that, Sometimes uh, I find it helpful to run it a little bit richer uh, because that's gonna be fluctuating as it is. Um, a real smooth flat track, you can usually get away with it a little bit leaner, okay? Relative to air, so when the air is cool and crisp and you're getting more oxygen in the air, you can typically run a little bit richer setting on it. That richer setting is gonna allow more fuel when there's more oxygen, more fuel. When you combine that, you get a, you get a better explosion. Um, in humid and hot conditions where you don't have as much oxygen in the atmosphere, you can get away with a leaner setting. Again, you don't have as much oxygen, so you don't need as much fuel to go with it. So this is one setting. There's other settings in here as far as uh, internally the jets. Um, on a maintenance perspective, it's really important to clean those jets, okay? I've had some, many situations where the carburetors have sat long periods of time with fuel in them, and they've fired up and they start no problem and they run great. And that is not the way you want to live your life when it comes to carburetor maintenance. Because the one time that becomes an issue, it's usually a major issue. And then you start chasing which circuit is it. Um, so you have an ad a main jet and an atomizer tube, as well as a pilot jet or a low speed jet in the carburetor. There's three of them. Um, well, at the shop, I'll use a little one gallon can of carburetor and choke cleaner. So we'll disassemble the carburetors from a week to week basis. You don't have to pull the jets out if you're doing that because you submerge it and it tends to clean everything out altogether, okay? So and if you're doing it from week to week, it's probably overkill to be honest with you, but if you do take the time and do it, you're gonna eliminate really having any issues at all with it. Um, every couple of weeks is probably you know, good enough. Um, you're not gonna be giving up a ton of performance. You're gonna probably eliminate having any issues of something sticking and you're getting too much fuel or something literally getting clogged up and then fuel's not going to where it needs to be. So taking those jets out on occasion is a good idea. Um, soaking the carburetor is a good idea. Uh, you wanna make sure you get all the rubber pieces out. So your cap and that, uh, that your throttle cable goes through, none of that needs to go in there. There is a rubber gasket on there. Um, the other uh, adjustable jet on here that you can adjust uh, on the carb body is the air mix screw. Okay, so when you're looking on the side of the carburetor, you have two screws. You have the silver screw in the center, that's your idle screw, and then you have your air mix screw on the bottom towards the front, to the, towards the intake of the carburetor. The air mix is your adjustment. The throttle screw, obviously it adjusts your throttle and how the carburetor idles. Um, it literally pushes your slide up and down. The air mix screw adjusts how much air is coming in and mixing with the fuel. So when you wind this all the way in, you close it off, you're allowing nothing in, there's no air, okay? As you open it up, you're allowing air to mix with the fuel. When it's closed off, it won't run at all. So let's say you were doing some maintenance and you can't get it started. It's one thing to check, because a lot of times people will they'll 
wind it all the way in to check how far out it is because it is an adjustment, but they'll forget to back it back out. So you always want to make sure that you check that if you're, especially if you're having any issues with it starting, usually right after maintenance. That screw there, I think the factory recommendations are somewhere from three quarters of a turn out to like two and a quarter turns out. So it's a pretty wide range. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the slide needle position and that together. But the reason it's a wide range is because, again, it depends on the air. So like real cool, crisp air, you'll run it a little bit leaner or a little further in, which is going to be more fuel, so a little richer. When you have crummy air, hot, humid air, you're going to back it out a little bit more. Um, just uh, it's, you're, what you're doing is you're changing your carburation, your fuel air mix for the temperature, the ambient temperature. That also applies to elevation as well. Here we don't have to worry so much because you're at the same place for the most part. So that's kind of the basics of, of uh, the body of the carb and the adjusters on it. So one of the main points of uh, maintenance aside from cleaning is removing and changing your floats in the needle. So this little pin here, it's a little bit easier to show you when the float is out. Slides through your two uprights here, okay? So how many of you had, had it apart? I know you guys have already had it apart. Craig's had it apart, Joe's had it apart, okay. You've worked on bikes before, right? So. So this float and the needle together is, is pretty tricky. And, and uh, for you guys in the back, well, like I said, afterwards, we'll sit down and go over a little bit more in depth. So when installing the float, you want to make sure you're lining your inlet needle up with the seat and you're dropping it down. And once, those, once your uh, float hole is lined up with these uprights, then the pin's going to go through. That holds everything together. When you're putting your bowl on, you always want to keep an eye on this pin. It can get offset. Uh, if you turn it over, tap it a little bit, you'll see it actually starts to move around a little bit. It's real easy for that thing to kind of slide out. So if you're getting everything together and you're holding it like this and you're getting this ready, I've seen people lose that pin and not be able to, it, um, not be able to put the carb together so that it runs efficiently. All right, so that's real important. You wanna make sure that pin's in there. Changing your float is probably a good idea every few uh, race weekends. It could be over maintenance. All right, so the float pin, real important piece to the puzzle. Again, if you're turning the carb on the side before you put the uh, float bowl back on, you want to really double check and make sure it's in place. Um, it's really hard to find in the dirt. I've seen it a number of times. All right, so we got our float out. This is how you're going to clean your carb if you're going to soak it. Um, the rubber o-ring in the back comes out, the float is out. Uh, typically in the solutions that you're soaking in, you're not going to put plastic or rubber in there. Um, you could leave it in there. Uh, usually I leave them in for like a half hour, 45 minutes. The fuel and uh, some of the varnish in there does dissolve pretty quick. Afterwards, I've talked to people, they've done a number of different things afterwards to rinse it. I usually go through mineral spirits first. Um, and then I, I'm actually kind of a fan of cleaning them with water and simple, warm water and simple green. In the shop, we use an ultrasonic cleaner. It doesn't have to be that detailed. But warm water and simple green, it helps get some of the grit and stuff that will stick to, to the solvent and to some of the oils like that out of there. If you do that, no matter what you're cleaning with, you want to make sure you clean it really well with an uh, air gun or brake cleaner. Brake cleaner works pretty well because it's high pressure. You can, you can blow it through any of the jets and it dries pretty quickly, so it's not going to leave any residue behind. So on reassembly, now that we've got it clean, we're ready to put everything back together. Can I kind of rehash the uh, float installation? So you got to make sure your needle is on the tab correctly so that the needle is there without just um, holding itself on with the tab. We're going to drop this down. We're going to install our float pin. Small yep, the small <laughs> fingers. You have the kids help you out or we're going to drop the needle out. Keep an eye on the needle. That's typically what happens when there's a problem. If you don't catch it, it, it's catastrophic because nothing runs. So you get nothing but fuel. All right, so we got our float pin back in. We got our float in place. Everything looks honky dory here, okay? Everything's free. You want to make sure nothing's bound up. On occasion, I've seen some of the floats come out of the bags. Um, there's, there's two tabs on them for adjustments. Mm -hmm. If you look closely, there's the small tab here. This, yep. is, this is what affects the drop. I've seen it where those are bent too much, and that's when you, when you set this uh, upright, the float will fall and the needle will fall right out. All right? The other thing is sometimes this tab here in the center is a little bit bound up. Um, everything looks good on here. You want to be able to see the needle moving up and down as that float moves. Everything looks pretty, uh, 
pretty standard here, no big issues. Okay. And so to check your float height, that's when we go back to our float gauge. Now, we usually set our floats at 860 thousandths, as mentioned. You want to put the carb on a flat surface. It's the easiest way to do it. And uh, let me move this over here for you guys. It's the easiest way to do it. And we're going to use our preset float height gauge. And we're going to scan right across where the float bowl and the carb meet. And if you look, there's really no gap in there, right? Pretty close. So sometimes they'll be uneven. You can just give it a little bit of a tweak to even them out. Um, typically we set them even. This, that is not a rule to live by depending on your engine mount. So, okay, some people have a very steep inclined engine mount that makes things trickier because if that's the case, sometimes you'll offset it. We typically use an eight degree mount. Uh, one of the reasons I like using the eight degree mount is because you do have a little less uh, issue with that and having to really dial in the float uh, because of the angle of a 15 degree mount. So this is nice, okay? It's just touching the float. All right, if you look closely, this gauge makes it really easy. You can use a, um, a dial indicator. It's another way to measure it. It's a little bit trickier, a little bit more to hang on to. Um, so Craig, so we're going across. It looks good. Let's get it out of whack, okay? So we can see what it looks like when it's not right. Okay, so now we put our new floats in and up. We got a problem here, right? See how much higher that is. The issue you're gonna run into there again is that's gonna lean out your mixture, okay? It's gonna shut that flow of fuel off a lot sooner. So to adjust the height is the center tab that the needle, the inlet needle hooks to, okay? So you, a small screwdriver, you're gonna go right in between here. If you guys wanna kinda yep. come in and take a look, this is the tab that you're actually gonna be adjusting, mm -hmm. okay? John, I know you know, but, so you're gonna go underneath it to bend it up or you can push down on the top to straighten it out. All right, that's the tab you're gonna use. Then once your float height is set, you wanna double check it with your gauge. Looks good. In this case, we're gonna pull this one back up a little bit. And the flat screen driver actually. So you're gonna go right into the center, twist that little tab back up, and check the height. And they we're pretty close. All right, looks good. So once your flow height's set, and we're back to buttoning up the bottom end of the carburetor here. So again, when you're installing the float bowl O-ring, you wanna make sure it's well in its place. I like picking the carb up, and this is where it gets tricky. Again, remember the float pin. You gotta keep an eye on it. So when you pick it up, I usually turn it this way. If you turn it sideways, that's when things go sideways. The needle, the pin can come out. All right, we're gonna slowly slide the bowl back on. Make sure our O-ring stays within the groove, okay? So Jamie, it's not all that precise in terms of setting. I mean, how, how do you know where to set it, depending on conditions? Well, I mean, you, you kind of go off of a baseline and then from there, if you're having a stumble or if you're having a, like a backfire issue up on top, that's gonna, that's gonna be kind of your first indicator that you have an issue with, with if the carb's running rich or lean. Um, like I said with that, for me, I like that 860 thousandths baseline. I leave it there quite a bit because I, I can do a lot of the tuning with uh, the air mix and with the clip on the slide. Okay, so that's, you know, everyone's gonna, like I said, each engine builder is gonna have a different recommendation for you. So uh, that's typically where we work with them. Um, on the dyno, sometimes you see differences. It just depends on what kind of air you're dealing with. So um, it's one of those things for me, for, for the beginner, and f even for guys that are um, looking for, to stay a little bit lower maintenance, that particular height kind of helps put you in that range. Yeah. So you don't have to be tuning with it. If you're running on the, on the way rich side or the far lean side, you're gonna end up having to adjust that more often. Yeah. So I like to hover in the middle or lean a little bit to the rich side and then I can uh, do more of the work with the, with the needle clip on the slide and with the air mix jet. If you're at the pointy end of the field, though, it is worth it. Right, it is worth playing with and I would say 10 thousandths increments are gonna be a good way to kind of uh, follow up on uh, if you're gonna make changes, 10 thousandths increments at a time, and then reanalyze after that. So, and you can use uh, data. Now, most places you can't run an EGT sensor, but I mean, there are things that you can have on board for practice days that could help 
kind of dictate if it's working or not. We do run EGT sensors on the dyno. You don't see a huge difference on them yeah. um, with the four stroke. Yeah, the two cycle's a lot more sensitive, but with the four cycle stuff, it's not as drastically different. So, so when you get that done, you want to make sure you button up, button up the bowl here and tighten that up. All right. And then always remember, if you did drain the bowl with the uh, bowl drain, make sure that's tight as well. I've seen that plenty of times. If it's not completely tight or that, you're going to get a little bit of a leak. So you can have an issue there with it running as well. All right, and when you're done, we're going to put our O-ring back in the carburetor. And now the base of our carburetor is back together and ready to put back on the cart. So you got your carburetor cleaned up. We got the, we got the float heights checked. Everything's ready to go. We're going to bolt it back on, OK? Again, make sure your O-ring is in place. This is super critical, okay? The other thing that's super critical is alignment to your intake manifold. So there's not a lot to be gained on the Briggs engine, all right? Flow is one of the things that's, that's pretty critical, though. So if you look at your inlet manifold, you have your, set, you have your inlet hole and you have your two mounting screws for the carburetor, okay? The one side is slotted. It's slotted so that you can twist the carburetor back and forth. Ideally, Everything would be flat. Your float would be flat. If you tip the engine up, you can rock the carburetor back to kind of, because of the slotted mounting holes, to keep the floats uh, more parallel, okay? By doing that, it also changes your inlet passage through the carburetor into that intake manifold. So I'm gonna put these screws back in and we're gonna start, uh, we're gonna start the process of putting the carb back on, okay? So like I said, it's just a little flange nut, not, not a nylock nut. So you can thread it on typically with your fingers all the way up to make it snug where the carb flange is up against the intake manifold. All right, then we're gonna start with the second side. We're gonna get both of these on. Right, yeah, there are different bolts depending where you raise. Some of the series are now wiring the engines for inspection. So they will have different bolt kits uh, I think for like the route kit, some of them were just like this. It was a longer bolt and then you put a cable through. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you basically seals up through your, through your carburetor. And you run it through your uh, header. Oh wow, this is a long. Yeah. All right, so I've got our carburetor on here. And just for the sake of a display, I'm gonna push it all the way down, okay? Now, I'm gonna kind of come around. You're going to look down the bore there. I you see you. any yeah. issues? Yep, I see it. Yeah. Looks good or bad? Yeah. 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 All right. Yep. So, actually, if you guys want to you guys want to yeah. stand up and get a little better view here. Right. I'm going to shine this light in here. I'm going to take each of you guys. All right. If you look right down on the bottom side here. No, they're calling. Here. <laughs> All right. It's here. This is probably, is this, what's that? Does that look a little better? All right, so if you look down there at the bottom of the carburetor, you're gonna see the intake manifold. You're gonna see the edge of the intake manifold, okay? So if you look at the bottom side of it. Okay. All right, so let's say if we were to, right. if you're following the bottom of the carb, we're bumping up against the intake manifold. So that poses a problem of flow because if you're looking in there, I'll shine that down there for you. Right. Yep. If you're looking in there, you got a, you got a brick wall at the bottom of your carburetor. So what you've done is you've essentially made your whole intake smaller. Okay. So this, if you're running a restricted slide, it's probably not as critical. Honestly, it's not going to be as critical or as noticeable. However, with a, with a full open slide, it's going to be more noticeable. So what that's doing is it's taking away a, a pretty big chunk of performance. Okay. So you want to make sure that that's aligned with that manifold. Now where this poses a problem is, again, if you're running a really high angled engine mount and you're trying to get your, your floats a little bit flatter, the issue you run into is you put this all the way down and you get your float set, but if you don't check your intake, most likely you're giving up quite a bit of airflow into the, into the uh, intake and into the head of the engine, okay? So the range that you have on the carburetor to mount seems huge, but the usable range where you're not obstructing the flow is much smaller. Like a small mag light, um, I use the, honestly, I use my phone light quite a bit because it's usually handy, but it's also a little bit brighter. And you always want to make sure you're lining up that intake. And you do have a little bit of movement on both sides, okay? The one side is fully slotted. The other side is just a hole. Typically, when I'm starting and I put the carburetor on, I'm always pushing down on the non-adjustable side and getting as much out of there as I can. 
and you can snug that up a little bit. You still have a little bit of movement here. And then I'm always, I'm usually dropping the back side of the carburetor down as far as I can to still allow the be, uh, not seeing the lip of the intake manifold. Okay. So right here, once I find the happy place there, I'm snugging that up. And the reason why I always bring it down as far as I can is because even with an eight degree mount, you're, you're putting an angle on that float bowl setup. Okay. So now if you look down there, you're probably not seeing that big lip on the bottom if you look straight down the center of it. On the flip side too, if you have this uh, too high up, you're gonna see the intake manifold on the top side of the carburetor. So that's a real critical thing uh, to watch for. And if you go through post-race inspection or tech and they have that off, it's just something you wanna be comfortable doing so that when you do reassemble, you're not gonna put yourself in a position because if you made it to tech one day and you don't align the carburetor, it's probably a good chance you're not gonna make it to tech the next day because it does make that big of a performance difference, okay? Um, one other thing on the carburetor, we were talking about adjustments on it. So I'm gonna touch on the slide a little bit right now. Um, so your slide and your needle setup, that's what regulates your throttle opening, okay? So if you know about the restricted slides and the non-restricted slides, that's uh, this black piece is the slide. They make them in different colors, different lengths, depending on the category that you're in, okay? This needle that slides through it is one of the few adjustable components on the carburetor. And if we take this out, we're gonna do it slowly because there is a clip that holds it in. There's a clip on the needle and then there's a spring that holds it in. So if you look up here, this is your spring that's holding it in. Okay, and this is your needle. This is your slide, okay? All together makes the assembly, all apart, lets you adjust it. So if you look on your needle here, you got different positions that you can install that clip in. As you drop the clip down the needle, you're allowing more fuel and it comes into the, carbur into the uh, uh, center of the carburetor faster, okay? As you raise it up, it leans it down. So again, a real hot day, crummy air, you're gonna run that needle clip higher, okay? You're gonna lean out your mixture. A real cool day, if it's cold out, really dry, you can drop that needle clip down. As you drop it down, you're getting more fuel into the system, okay? This kind of coincides with the air mix, and we'll talk about that in just a second here. Once you do, if you're making any adjustments, you always wanna make sure that needle clip is fully installed in the needle. I've seen it where they're not fully installed and they can actually pop off. And then once that happens, the needle can fall all the way down into the, carb into the carburetor and it just shuts off your fuel flow. Nothing catastrophic, but you know, it could be a missed attempt at a race. So when you, when you have that uh, adjusted or set where you want, you're gonna drop that back in. Then it's really important to get your spring clip on there um, without it, this needle is gonna float up and down. So there's nothing holding it in. And what'll happen is you'll end up with a rich condition because the needle will never be closing the fuel flow off. This clip, how many guys have had the clip, the uh, spring clip in and out? John's shaking his head in an unsatisfactory way. <laughs> so it is, a, it is a pain in the butt. A needle nose is the best way to do it. Um, a real small needle nose is, the, is by far the best way. So I use a couple couple tools to put it in. I get a needle nose to start it and I use a really large Allen wrench as long as the end is clean to push that spring clip down into the uh, into the throttle slide. So I take the clip. I always put the opening of the spring to the uh, throttle cable groove in the slide and I'll drop that down. Now typically you can't get it that far in with a big needle nose. So if you see it, it goes about halfway in. That's where I take my large oversized Allen wrench just push it down so that's all the way flat. I like to make sure it's all the way flat. Usually when you put everything together, the spring will push it down the rest of the way as well. As well. But it can twist in there, so I always make sure it's all the way down before I uh, reassemble it. So that clip position, what that does, again, is it, it changes how much fuel or, uh, that you're getting through the carburetor. And it does go hand in hand with your air mix. So a rule of thumb, thumb that I have is if I'm running and I find that uh, my best setting on the air mix is really rich or really lean, I'll make an adjustment on the needle clip position, okay? So what we'll do like later today, kind of one-on-one -on -one if you guys want with Briggs engines, bring them over there, over, and I'll kind of show you a little demo on how to set the air mix while it's on the stand, okay? It's, it's basically, you're listening for something, you're watching the RPM on the gauge, and you're trying to maximize the idle RPM, okay? If you find that where your best setting is on here, again, is like three quarters or under, or over two and a quarter turns out, then making a uh, uh, change on the needle clip position is gonna help. 
If you're running that air mix all the way in, then you're gonna wanna richen your clip on the carburetor and then reset this, okay? And if you're running all the way out, you're gonna wanna lean the clip uh, on the needle and then reset your air mix. That air mix is nice uh, because, again, you can do it in the morning as the air changes. It does affect uh, the carb setting, but it's external, it's easy to do. And you can do it right on the stand with everything running. That's the best way to check it. So. Um, typically, it's going to be the clip position on the needle. It's typically going to be in like position two or three. Okay. Uh, most of the time, it'll be two, three, four. Pretty rarely are you all the way up on the top in like a full lean condition. When you push it down, does it all like go all the way to the top? Are you talking about the spring here? Oh, actually. Exactly. No, so that spring just holds the needle in. Oh, okay. So actually, if you come on over here, Jim. So the clip, because you're a little bit further away. So the clip position is this clip. I see. Yeah, you put that on first. On those there. grooves. Yep, gotcha. Yeah, so those will move up and yeah, down. I, I couldn't see that from back there. Yeah, exactly. That. Yeah. So that's what, that's your actual adjustment. So you, we can adjust that. That's okay. You can adjust it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is this more of a gross adjustment than this than the air intake screw? Yeah, this to me is a is a uh, more coarse adjustment, course, and then yeah. you can do you can kind of do a little bit of fine tuning okay. with the air mix. So yeah. And they, like I said, they do go hand in hand. Um, if you adjust this, you'll notice. Uh, when you're resetting your air mix, that it's probably not going to be in the same spot as yeah, the yeah, session yeah. previous. Yeah. All right, so now we get to put this in again. So that's that's um, pretty much the nuts and bolts of the carburetor.